Welcome back to Coming Up Next, the podcast. Before we get into episode 169 with uh, stop motion animator and filmmaker Robert Morgan, head to comingupnext.com.au. You can find the whole back catalogue of podcast rambles there. You can also find links to Stitcher, iTunes, and Podbean, where you can subscribe to the show. If you subscribe to the show, it's going to come into your phone each and every week for free. You support the show, the show comes to you, and it's going to come to you right now. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Coming Up Next, the podcast. I'm Alistair Marks. This is my show. This is my podcast. Uh, Thank you to Maha Wilson for joining me on the show last week. Maha is an actor, an Australian actor. Uh, She was born in Iraq, came to Australia uh, at the age of six, and she has a quite incredible story uh, that she shares with us. If you haven't listened to it, comingupnext.com.au is going to be the place for you to find it. And uh, this week, for the first time, I have a a stop-motion animator on the show. His name is Robert Morgan, Um, and if you'd like to familiarise yourself with his work, you can do so on his YouTube channel, which is uh, is under Robert Morgan on YouTube. It's um, it's pretty incredible stuff. It's certainly unique, uh, and we talk about his process, becoming a stop-motion animator, some of his live-action work. We talk about the usual philosophical musings. We talk about his, uh, his upcoming feature film debut, uh, The Red Laugh. Uh, so without further ado, episode 169 of Coming Up Next, the podcast with Robert Morgan. get to do many podcasts um done a fair amount of interviews um podcasts i've done a yeah i've done a few podcasts not actually i did a podcast recently actually which was um not about my work at all it was actually just about um discussing uh underappreciated uh, horror movies uh, right and uh with some friends of mine so we sort of dissected uh, this movie extra do you know that film? i do not know it's it. like a obscure uh sort of british horror sci-fi horror film from about 1983 84 that's widely considered not great <laughs> but i uh, we had this kind of conversation where i sort of defended it and uh, dissected it so that was the, that was the last podcast i did yeah right which was fun yeah that was a good laugh <laughs> <laughs> so is horror your kind of is that your genre of choice yeah i guess um i mean i like all kinds of films but Horror is what I kind of grew up watching, and it's my go-to genre, I suppose. Yeah, there's a lot of crap that I that, that I you'd have to sift through to get to the gems, but there are gems. And so you grew up watching lots of different horror films. Yeah, that when I was a kid, I watched well anything with monsters in it, really. Right. But, um, hor- that, and then from it's like monster movies is a sort of gateway drug into <laughs> into horror movie harder horror movies and so on and then that that weirdly you get you get into kind of arty horror movies or weirder horror movies which then gets you into art movies so it sort of is a path i suppose it's a, a my the path through horror has led me to all kinds of other kinds of things as well yeah do you remember what the kind of gateway film that you saw was what monster yeah film um, not particularly. I was just consuming a lot of monster movies. I mean, really, I suppose it probably goes back to things like Star Wars. Mm. But when I watched Star Wars, it was the monsters I liked more than anything else. And then that led me to monster movies. Yeah, anything with monsters. In American Werewolf in London was an early one. Um, the Thing, Alien, things like that. Right. You grew up in uh, in Hampshire? Yeah, I grew up in... Well, no, I, I was born in Coventry, but I, and I lived there for the first six years of my life and then I um, moved to a small town called Yately uh, when I was about six which was sort of where I met most of my friends and then remained in that area probably till I was about 20 so that was a sort of yeah it's just like a small sort of one of those small sort of satellite towns outside of London which kind of takes overspill from London Right, you know, whereas people are moving, spreading out from London into the suburbs. So my parents ended up in one of these sort of towns outside of London, with access to London, 
you know, but not in London. And were you making little films or doing little uh, animations or anything like that at a young age or was it something that came later? No, I never made any films until I was about um, 19 was the first stuff I ever made. Up until then, I was doing a lot of... Uh, uh, I was I always did art, so I painted a lot and um, uh, I always drew pictures and uh, but didn't really... Because I didn't have access to any camera, any film cameras. I mean, in those days, there was no... Um, uh, you know, a vid- like a video camera, because I didn't have like I didn't know anything about film cameras, but a video, a VHS sort of camcorder would probably cost about eight hundred pounds. You know, that's not the kind of money you you can get as a kid and go and buy that kind of kit. So I never had access to a film cam- to a camera that could make moving images until much later, until I saved, I got a job and saved money up and got a seven hundred pound camcorder and then made my first experiments with that. Really, right. When so, I was at art college. So what was kind of satiating your, I suppose, creative impulses? Like, do you remember what the first kind of um, medium of art that you dabbled in that, that really excited you was? It would have been drawing. When I was a kid, I was always drawing. And I used to draw a lot of monsters a lot of weird creatures and stuff. And also me and my friends used to draw... This was way before the movie Gremlins came out, but we invented our own Gremlins, uh, which were these kind of weird little spiky sort of um, uh, black critter things with sharp teeth. And we would draw endless photographs of them sort of massacring the, 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 this... this um, really committing genocide on this race of... <laughs> of, uh, of, uh, uh, of what the gremlins arch enemies were which were the flower people right <laughs> and so these like these these flower men would get in, would get like massacred by these gremlins and th- me and two of my friends would draw these things endlessly and then i ended up deciding to um, make a, a directory of every single gremlin in the race of the gremlins and i would name them all and 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 draw them and 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 uh, list their occupation and i did like about hundred pages of this stuff documenting wow. like hundreds and hundreds of these of these creatures <laughs> <laughs> did they have like uh, normal human names and jobs or? no they had like uh sort of orc type names right. like like grendel face smasher and <laughs> like d- d- door kid uh flower man eater you know stuff right. like that. i guess his job was pretty self-explanatory yeah there is really violent stuff actually and we yeah. were just like it, you know just go around each other's house and just draw this carnage you know Mm. like for hours and hours and hours what do you, I mean I suppose at the time you don't really have any sort of self-awareness about it but reflecting on that now in, in the context of the work that you do um, that you do now what do you think it was that kind of fascinated you about that kind of darker world of things I mean for me it was more about creating a world of characters and uh, and activities for those characters. I always associate it in my mind with really with playing with toys, actually. Like, because when I was young and I was obviously playing with Star Wars toys and stuff like that, I would get really lost for hours in the staging of, um, of, of, uh, you know, reenacting stuff from the films, but also riffing on it and making my own versions of stuff that happened outside the, those films, uh, creating my own sort of sets out in my garden out of dirt and wood and stuff like that and um re- you know getting sort of drama going on and fights going on and you know that i think was the key for me when i i associate that kind of creativity with the creativity i did later on with the films with animation films because you're doing a similar thing you're building miniature <laughs> characters and and sets for them and you're 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 staging things for them to do yeah i used to do similar thing but with uh wrestling figures and yeah ninja yeah. turtles and yeah. gi joes yeah. and just have these really long elaborate storylines going that i would somehow uh like you know you, you just always remember like the continuity would generally be pretty good from memory yeah yeah and i think i mean to me i would get lost in that for hours and hours yeah. and hours and just the whole days would go past where i was just lost in this world of these these characters yeah um and 
so I suppose coming into school, primary school, high school, was this kind of creativity or this, uh, this I suppose, um, desire that you were feeling, uh, was that something that was at the forefront or was it just something that you were kind of doing as a hobby or on the weekends or whatever? It was always a hobby. Like I had teachers at school who thought I was good at drawing, for example, and tried to encourage it. And uh, one of my teachers commissioned me to do a drawing for her, <clears throat> which I did eventually. But it sort of felt a bit like homework. So I didn't enjoy it that much. And I think maybe somewhere around the school time is one of the problems, I think, that, that, that is inherent with school is art is not considered a serious subject. And so it got pushed, you know, to the side a little bit where like acad more academic subjects become more important. I had some teachers really irresponsibly would tell me not to even do my art subjects or, or, or not concentrate on them much because they weren't important. And English is important or geography is important and maths is important art's not important so if you've got like a workload and you have to prioritize put art at the bottom and that was taught to me you know by non-art teachers and the art teachers we had were not great either so there was a period you know where other things kick in hormones kick in you discover girls you discover going out you discover getting pissed with your mates that stuff took over for a while and the art stuff kind of you know get got maybe for a while got put on the back burner yeah and and your folks are they artistically inclined or were they encouraging or they were indifferent or they were encouraging i mean my dad sort of was quite creative in a way and would like also like to draw um my mum is not really creative but i think they were they were encouraging to me they did they you know their attitude is like do whatever you want if you if it makes you happy do it if not fine but i think they I think my dad was sort of behind the scenes was was kind of having conversations with my art the the teacher that um that commissioned that drawing i think behind the scenes i think he was having a bit of a conversation with her about whether i should be encouraged more or sent to different you know a, a more artistic kind of environment and things like that i got glimpses of that so i think they were encouraging but um at the same time i think they wouldn't you know they didn't care whether i didn't do it they weren't like pushing me in, in any direction yeah and when you finished school um was was it was art was going to like study art or filmmaking was that something that you were quite set that you wanted to do or were you more thinking about doing something else or what was your trajectory from there um filmmaking was always on the back I mean, I never thought filmmaking was a serious option because I just didn't have it, didn't know anything about it other than liking films. Didn't know anything about how you'd go about... I didn't know actors or I didn't know anything about how, the, how you made that stuff. Uh, what I did know... I rediscovered art again in the sixth form. So when I was about like maybe 16, 17, I sort of, dis I sort of got back into it. And, um, and I wanted to, wanted to do more artistic stuff but it was very vague at that point. So I, w I basically went and I did a sort of foundation, like a um, national diploma, it was called, in general art and design, which allows you to sort of try all kinds of things. To, uh, sort of um, a bit of 3D um, sculpting stuff, drawing, fine art, graphics, that kind of thing. I did two years of that. So that kind of got me back into the... And then, you know, you're at a place where everybody's doing art. So all of your... All of your all of the people you're hanging out with are all doing art rather than just like one or two of them. So that sort of changed things a little bit as well. Right. And then you went to film school after that. Yeah, then I, well, then I went to, and studied animation because again, I was interested in films, but I, or, I'd never made any films, but what I did have was lots of sculptures and drawings. And uh, I had started with that, getting this kind of cheap, well, not, not cheap in those days, video camera. Um, what was that shooting on, like, beta? That was VHS. VHS, right. Yeah, yeah. So really kind of, yeah. really basic uh, mini VHS. So there was, like, mini VHS tapes uh, and it went that in you the... could slot inside a, a cartridge that made it into a bigger VHS. Yeah, yeah, tape. yeah, I remember those. So it was recording straight onto VHS tape. And um, I had started dabbling with making some of the drawings move and filming some kind of like experiments with liquid in water like washing up liquid in water and getting weird abstract shapes and things like that to just make almost like moving sort of experimental 
It's kind of stop motion sort of stuff. The 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 I was animating a little bit of drawings, but not really doing stop motion at that that stage. Um, uh, but then actually, well, so jumping forward to the end of that of the uh, the the the, the um, national diploma I did. So I did do a stop motion film for my graduation film. So I made some puppets and I made my first ever stop motion film, which is this four and a half minute really crude thing <laughs> shot on VHS tape called Paranoid. Which is actually on YouTube. Someone did somehow upload it onto right, YouTube. Cool. You, can, you can see it. Um, it's pretty pretty crude, but it's it's surprisingly when I look at it now, it's it's surprisingly coherent in terms of the stuff in there is still stuff I'm sort of doing now, but on a hopefully on a better scale. Right. And what was your first experience? I mean, what was the experience of putting that together in terms of the process? Because I understand that stop motion animation is such a kind of intricate uh, process in terms of from conception to completion, something that's even just four and a half minutes t- would take so much time and so much labor. Yeah, um, the the video camera I had at the time would only shoot, um, it could only divide each second into four. So the 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 highest frame rate you could get in terms of animation, you could do four movements per second. So it's very jerky. So each each sort of pose of the puppet is lasting a quarter of a second. So it's like, eh, 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 eh. that's the kind of rhythm of it. Very, very jerky. Whereas traditionally, uh, you're doing 24, 25 frames per second, which is really labor intensive. So actually, it didn't take as long uh, as as later films did because I was really only moving the puppet a few frames a second um but but yeah it was a full production i mean i built the puppets i built sets um you know i built armatures the skeletons inside the puppets that could move frame by frame and pose um i had live maggots in the film because <laughs> it, it was a sort of horror thing well kind of a sort of psychological thing um i'd, I'd just seen repulsion the polanski movie at that time it really affected me and um so I wanted to make something that was enclosed in a single location where a character is sort of hallucinating. So that was the premise of it. Um, it took, it probably took, a, I mean, I don't, in hindsight, I can't remember how long it took, but it must have taken about a month or two to make it. And did you just teach yourself the method behind yeah. it? Yeah. Like just from, from top to bottom in terms of like creating the puppets, creating the sets and doing the actual animation component? Yeah, I did. I, I It was just like trial and error and, you know the puppets were made out of papier mache, but the wood I was like using copper wire for the armatures, and um, my mum knitted some like polar neck jumpers for them, <laughs> <laughs> and made trousers for them out of like old old jumper I had, and um, uh, uh, the floor of the set was this, the garage floor, my parents' garage floor, so it didn't have a, so I shot it on the floor, so it was like um, very very basic, but it had all the kind of components, you know, it was like a sort of three wall like theater set really so it didn't have much um flexibility with where you put where you put the camera it was pretty basic but but um it had the same kind of sort of uh insular atmosphere that the other the later films had anyway so i think it was a it was an important first step very basic but yeah and the the post production process i mean was it in camera edited or did you actually it was um, no, I, I it was edited by hooking up two VHS videos to each other. Um, oh no, that's wrong. Actually, there was a there was a way that you could uh, hook a lead from the camera straight into a VHS recorder, and you could play from uh, the you could play segments of the shots from the video player directly onto a VHS tape, so you could record it directly on so it's kind of edited from the camera onto VHS tape and then um, I had discovered a way of um, creating two tracks on a VHS tape you could actually record into a VHS recorder on two separate soundtracks which I'd discovered through ac- by accident so it had two layers of sound to it which were sort of ticking clocks basically right. to get faster to create a sense of, ap- of escalation but it was, yeah pretty crude and what was your inspiration for the for the story it was um, having watched, so I discovered slightly more psychological horror films at that point. So like things like A Razorhead and Repulsion in particular 
Um, and I like the idea of a single location and a, and a single character who is experiencing a kind of hallucinatory sort of breakdown of some sort, you know. So that was the idea. And that's kind of where it was just somebody who has, has a paranoid nightmare and they're in bed and they're hallucinating things happening around them. That was the premise. There seems to be a kind of thread of those sort of themes in um, in a lot of the work that I've seen of yours. Yeah, I think so. I think that single location, dark, grimy location with a single character experiencing some kind of <laughs> yeah. you know <laughs> stuff happening happens a lot. And I like that sort of limited canvas. So I guess coming out of that experience moving through to when you start making things uh perhaps on a more experienced scale what's what's the kind of journey through there well after i did that film so i call it a film it's like it was like a vhs video <laughs> uh i went and did a three-year degree in animation at um the surrey institute of art and design in farnham and i didn't i wasn't very productive there because i I was a, for the first two years you're kind of taken more in the direction of doing 2D drawn animation and a lot of like walk cycles and really boring stuff uh, but then in my third year I was able to sort of come back to what I wanted to do which was a, a really a, a, to take some of the ideas that I'd done in the my first film and develop them and, but make it like a better version of it so I ended up using 16 millimeter film shooting 24 frames a second with much better puppets a more sophisticated um sense of filmmaking that i'd learned in that in those three years and i i, I ended up making a film in at that college which was sort of like i wouldn't say it's a remake <laughs> of paranoid which was my first thing but it was like a more um it took the same basic idea but made something much more complex and more ambitious that was a film called The Man in the Lower Left Hand Corner of the Photograph. I was going to say the premise sounded quite similar to, yeah. to that. Yeah. So that was, I feel like that was my first proper film where I really felt like that is a film that really stands up as a proper short film that I could be really proud of. And I still like it. I still think it works. It's Again, it's quite um, uh, crude in some ways. It's only got three tracks of sound. It's the the, the, the animation is a little bit sort of rough. The cinematography is quite basic. It was just lit with desk lamps and things like that. But it's I think it I think the story still works and I think it still has a good atmosphere. It still holds up. I think. I think that the story is obviously the the kind of key component whenever you're making uh, a piece of narrative film. Um, but I suppose it would be. Uh, I'd be interested to know what the difference was in terms of like the technical process for you. you mentioned that, you know, before you were shooting on VHS and kind of crudely putting together the puppets and things. Was there, was there a big difference in terms of the production scale going from the first to the second? Yeah, because the big difference was, was using 16 millimeter film. So the first one I did paranoid, I, w I could, you know, watch back immediately what I've done because it was just on video. But this time I was, shooting and not having a clue i mean it was like an old like a 16 millimeter bolex camera so i would point the camera i'd look through the lens i'd click i had to load the film so i had to figure out how to work with loading film and getting it right it was very stressful all that yeah. and then you'd shoot sometimes a day sometimes a shot could take two days to do a single shot and then you'd have to finish the roll of film off send it away and you wouldn't have a clue what you'd shot it was all done blind didn't have any video playback, any video assist. So I'd shoot and shoot and shoot. And I could have I could be shooting on one roll of film for like two weeks. I had no idea whether any of these shots had even if the exposure was right or anything. Send the, the film away and then you'd have to wait until the film comes back. The only way I could watch the film was going into college, locking myself in like one of the Steam Beck rooms, and loading the film onto a Steam Beck editing editing desk and watching it, you know, the old fashioned way. And so those, those, and still those, those days when I would get the film back and go and watch it were highly stressful days because I had no idea whether the shots worked, whether the animation worked, whether they were exposed correctly. And there were some moments where you watch it and go, okay, well, that's just totally overexposed and unusable. You'd have to reshoot stuff. But mostly I was really pleased actually with what I was seeing, just seeing beautiful 16 millimeter film. The animation was surprisingly good. 
and um yeah that that was the biggest difference that was like a huge difference um and it's still the only time i've i've made a film without any kind of video assist so it's the only film i've made where i had no idea what i was getting until i would watch it back you know weeks later so you're kind of just doing a frame at a time you set it click your shutter release one frame move it slightly click it and just basically yeah repeat repeat um and hope that it it's not crap you know because this <laughs> could very easily become crap yeah. sometimes the puppet would actually fall over you'd have to put it back into what where you think was the right place but you had no way of checking because i didn't have a video assist i couldn't wind back the video and say oh yeah to the last frame say yeah, okay match it up that's where it was you'd have to just guess i think it was standing around here <laughs> <laughs> you know and put it back and then continue animating and hope it was all right hope that it doesn't jump around yeah and surprisingly it was usually pretty good so um it's not something it's not a way i would like i would ever work again but it was maybe a good thing to have gone through because it teaches you a lot of um of self-control and concentration i was going to say do you think that it gave you a really good grounding and education uh as a as a stop motion animator yeah because i think i you know learning the most learning how to do it in the most difficult way possible means it becomes easier when you have better tools i mean nowadays i have i shoot digitally with drag and frame i can see everything on my laptop i know exactly what i've got if something falls over i can match the frame perfectly etc it's much easier now but i think having gone through the that i think that concentration re remains and the, the the sense of heightened focus you know remain remains I don't seem to remember having when I did the first one. So it, I think it did leave a sort of residue of like um intensity when I'm when I'm working that still is there. Mm. I guess it's a good backstop to have to 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 know that you can do it in the dark so to speak. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah. I would never choose to do it like that again <laughs> cuz it was pretty just horrific, stressful. Sounds time. like it would have been uh, tedious as well. It's very tedious. It's cuz also when you're doing when you when you can watch stuff back, it it, it keeps you it keeps the enthu the enthusiasm up cuz you can see it and go, "Oh, that looks great. Okay, that's that's really working." Keeps the um keeps the excitement up which is really important when you're working on something for a long period of time whereas if you can't see anything it's like yeah you don't know what you're getting it's a bit more tantric yeah <laughs> yeah it's, 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 so you are sort of channeling something it's kind of a a sort of um mysterious process and stop motion animation that's for sure so the next thing you made was the cat with hands yeah i mean for anyone who's listening who's curious um a lot of your work is available on on your youtube channel i think most of it's on youtube yeah I think the cat with hands was the first piece that I watched, and I mean, I'd love to know how you even came up with the concept. Well, the concept actually comes from a recurring nightmare that my sister, my older sister, used to have when she was a kid. So she had this recurring, and I was so I was I'm about three or four years younger than her, and uh, when I was when she was probably about twelve, so I would have been about eight. She had this recurring nightmare about. A cat with human hands it's just a normal house cat but it had like big human hands and it I mean, was it's chasing. terrifying yeah it's so weird and it would chase her and her friends around and uh it you know it terrified her for, for for it seemed to go on for my memory of it is that it seemed to go on for a very long time that it, it, it recurred many many times and the cat the, the the cat with hands she would always be crying about it and talking about it and this iconic thing this image the cat with hands was part sort of a key memory really from my childhood so um i thought it would be, it was a really interesting um image to start with so my when i started thinking of it as a potential character a centerpiece for a story it always felt to me if you're going to sort of transpose it into like an actual story sort of felt like it had a kind of folk tale or a fairy tale quality to it so then I had the idea that it lives in a well and then, you know, that kind of stuff all kind of, all the all the rest of it sort of so, sort of gravitated towards the central image that it was this, this cat with hands and how I could, and, and also the, the um, right from the very beginning it was designed to be a three minute film because that was the commission. It was for Channel 4 television and they were looking for three minute films. So it had to be three minutes. So I thought, how can I use that image and tell a really short story? involving that felt like a fairy tale and that was that was the 
the development of the idea was 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 from that perspective do you feel a certain level of freedom which it seems like a weird thing to talk about in the context of the the confinements of actually or the labor intensive nature of making stop motion animation but creatively do you feel like there's a freedom that you probably wouldn't get if you were making um live action sort of stuff i think there's um a greater degree of control over stop motion because you are i mean i sculpt all of my puppets as well so i make it's like you're making the actors yourself and then you are acting through the characters so you're kind of doing everything and i think um i guess there's a there's a greater level of control to create a very sealed sort of world so i like the idea of making worlds little self-contained experiences or dreamlike experiences you enter into when you watch a film and i think that's easier to achieve with um, stop motion animation because you can build everything exactly how you want and you can do it on a small scale so uh you can do stuff in a fairly small environment but create things that have the sense of being bigger and more epic than they are on a desktop you know on a table in a spare room so that's the advantages of it the disadvantages of it are the fact that you it's kind of a lonely process and the fact that you don't have that collaborative aspect that you get with live action because i do i do live action stuff as well and um i like the collaborative i like bringing other people into the world and hearing what they have to bring to it and creating a sort of mixing pot of, of collaboration which you get with live action so it's so i i like both sides of it for different different reasons but i think the key thing for animation is just the control the level of control is very appealing and what's it like when you then finish a piece of uh of animated work and put it out into the world i mean the cat with hands had quite a big impact when you did release it is it uh is it something where you kind of just acquiesce to the way people receive it or is there kind of something that you hope for or what's the what's that experience for you i think for me the most important thing is that i'm happy with it because there's nothing worse than making something that you just think oh that's a bit crap and i think if i'm happy with it i think i I trust that there will be other people who like it as well um and that's it and i think some of the film most well all of the films have had some people love them some people don't don't love them but um if you like the thing if you're happy with it then it, it it doesn't i don't really care if other people don't like it but because usually there are people that do like it uh and that's really i think you have to trust your own taste like that and as, that's I, that's something i've learned is that i i have to be happy with it because if i'm happy with it i know that other people will be happy with it if you're making something that you know you're compromising or you're making mistakes or it doesn't feel right then how is anyone else supposed to like it you know and uh was it separation that you made that was then um uh repurposed for a tool music video yes it was yeah that's pretty incredible well it it was done by some guy who took it uh took the film took all of the credits off it put his own name on it all uh, right and then said Maybe it was so a, cool. said it was a, a, a tool video so um it wasn't that cool for me. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so was it an official video or was it? It wasn't official. No. Right. It was okay. Some some fa- a fan thing, uh, and uh, you know this, and it got like a million hits and right. Everyone was going, oh wow, calling this guy a genius, and uh, he never once stepped in and goes, uh, guys, I didn't make it. I just like stole it and right. re-edited it and put my name on it. Oh fuck that guy. Um, he did put eventually at the I think at the very very end there's a tiny credit that says video clips taken from like the <laughs> but he's put his name as the director. And when it where it got, where it got really confusing is his first name was I think Morgan. Right. And so Morgan people, Robertson. It was like something like that and so 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 it got really confusing people thought like it was a it was me doing it but like in a different but like a different a version of my d- name. Was like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like no, no, it wasn't me, and yeah, oh, and I got like, and I, I ended up taking having it taken down because just because of the way it was done, and I, you know, I've got no nothing against Tool or any bands, but like it wasn't designed to be a music video. It's, yeah, it's a it's a short film, and uh, then I started getting hate mail from Tool fans, and it's like, mate, come on, yeah, calm down, that's not cool. <laughs> well, that must have been the opposite of what I had initially said. Yeah, it was. It probably has it. Uh, 
introduced the film maybe to, to some people to, to more people which is good but i mean it's not the way i would have wanted it to have been mm. discovered you know yeah i suppose that's a danger that artists face when they do put their work up online or kind of just make it accessible to anyone yeah that's always going to happen but um as i've got older I, I i don't care as much about that stuff anymore yeah and so i suppose moving into some of the later work you know you said that um the cat with hands was something that you did as a commission um and you've done commission work uh was abc's of death was that commissioned work or was that yeah i guess there's uh when you've got uh somebody comes to you in a way it was, I mean, it's commissioned in the sense that someone comes and says we would like you to do a segment for this film but you do whatever you want so it's not like they're saying it has to be this this yeah. this, and this as long as it fits the broad parameters so <clears throat> same with the cat with hands it was like well that it was a call for projects so it was like well okay i'm going to come up with an idea so it's not a very dictated you know commission it was still very open and um uh yeah abc's of death 2 was a similar thing where it was just um here are the, here are the here are the restrictions it's four minutes i think it has to be about death it has to be um uh a word that you choose beginning with a particular letter other than that here's the money do what you want you know so it's complete freedom really and basket case was that a similar experience that was a, a commission from arrow film so they approached me and said we'd like you to do a, a short we're, we're, they were releasing a blu-ray of basket case we'd like you to do a short piece that sort of um riffs on it in some way that, that we can put on the disc so but other, otherwise it was freedom to do whatever, you, whatever i wanted really so i sort of went off and made really my own film but set sort of it's kind of set in my kind of world, but it happens to be that Belial from Basket Case happens to have stumbled into my <laughs> sort of my kind of stop motion world. Right. And so you're given like a very basic sort of framework and then said, just do what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, the framework was really, it's like, really with that, it was like, just make something that's kind of Basket Case related. That was the framework, you know. I suppose with those commissions, uh, they're coming to you because you have developed this kind of tone and this voice and this uh, approach to stop motion animation do you think having kind of having developed something that is uh, so uniquely Robert Morgan um, that it's helped you helped to establish you as a as a creative as a as a, um, a filmmaker in a way that you probably wouldn't have been able to if it was if you were working in live action Possibly, yeah. I I don't really know. Um, I guess it's kind of hard to speculate. Yeah, I mean, I I I because I do other I I because I paint as well, and I and I've I've been working doing some live action stuff as well, and it it's always been the intention to try and make a body of work across all those formats that is somehow coherent, that there is a kind of relationship between all of those aspects, and. Um, uh the stop motion stuff just happened i just found certain um certain shortcuts and certain stylistic things that i found very easy to do and felt very correct to me aesthetically that i developed and pushed as far as i could and i think that became something um that people knew me for and i think that couldn't have happened in any other medium i think there's specific um qualities of stop motion animation that lend itself to a particular mood particular way of making the puppets and how they look and how they feel and um a particular approach to sound a particular approach to the types of environments that the character are existing in all of that sort of has added up to a yeah a very specific i guess um sort of mood and uh style but um but then it's like that thing when you when you do find that that mood and that style, part of you wants to kind of do something different, so yeah. to try and expand it at least, or 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 because or, um, it can be dangerous to just carve just such a specific you know path forever. I'd like to try different things as well, but still, hopefully, there's a coherence to it that it does feel like there's a there is an overall body of work there that relates to each other. So I suppose from top to bottom, then, how do you feel as though you're process both creatively and technically has expanded or evolved from the first piece up until 
this most recent piece for Basket Case? I think for me, the key thing was discovering silicon rubber. <laughs> right. That was the that was like a really big important moment because my first film, Paranoid, the puppets were made of papier mâché, and I didn't feel like that was right. Second film, the puppets were made out of latex and liquid latex, and and foam latex, and they had a a more fleshy look, but it looked more like rotting flesh, old rotting kind of flesh, and I I, I wanted to have to have something that was more uh, alive than that. And then when I discovered silicon rubber with the cat with hands, we made the hands out of silicon rubber, which really looks like flesh, like living flesh. That was a really big moment because then I realized I can really push that a lot further and make puppets that really feel like they're alive in some in some way. So when I did the separation, that was the the place where I really pushed the silicon rubber thing as far as I could take it, in particular to try and create a sort of Francis Bacon kind of quality to the puppets, which have this really visceral fleshy ultra fleshiness so i think that development has been the thing that making that creative leap into making characters and the thing about stop motion is it it makes things seem like they're hyper alive because they because of the just weird quality of the movement so if you combine combine that with the ultra fleshiness of the puppets i think it's very disturbing for people to watch and i think that was the area that i found like i found my i suppose and my voice or whatever <laughs> is like that little area there where the, the 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 puppets feel like they're um yeah hyper hyper living in some weird sort of disturbing way disturbing and visceral are definitely words that i would use um, yeah yeah definitely <laughs> especially in separation <laughs> yeah by a lot of the work but yeah 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 it's very intriguing as well yeah i think it's i think it's got emotional kind of dimension to it as well because he's I like the idea of like you you feeling conflicted about the characters where you're you have a you have a sort of uh, involuntary um, uh, like a sort of reluctance to engage with them, but you but you end up feeling for them. So there's this weird dislocation that you have when you're watching the film. Hopefully, I think also not using in most of the work anyway, literal language and using a more kind of emotional language yeah. and soundscape yeah. definitely adds to that feeling of discomfort, but then also that feeling of engagement. Yeah, I think it's... I never wanted to have... I don't think I've ever really had characters talking properly because it's like, what would they say, for starters? And secondly, I just really like the idea of the world being like a physical world, not a ver verbal world. And keep keeping it more like a, on a on a slightly different level of reality, so it's not quite. I think if characters start talking, you just hear the you hear the mundane human performance of it, and the words become t sort of very specific. And I think it's nice if it just remains on this slightly weirder subconscious level, which which removing any talking gives it a slightly more yeah interior sort of um, level of reality and it makes it a more universally accessible yeah. Story. Uh, yeah it also it makes it more yeah exactly yeah more universal so next up you're i suppose expanding your world into a feature film that you've been working on and developing for for a while yeah there's a there's a two or three actually okay yeah yeah is there a sense of um nervousness about trying to do something much bigger or does it feel like it's kind of a, pro a natural progression from where you from where you've been i think uh different challenges for different films one of the film i'm developing a live action film feature film which has animation in it i'm also developing a pure stop motion film feature film um they have different challenges the live action film has the challenges of all the you know working with a big production team and actors and um uh all of the the big the big the big machine of a film production a traditional film production and still figuring out how to get my voice across using all these different people and all this kind of all these big cameras and big lights and big you know big tracks and things <laughs> like that and all the team you know that you're working with um and then the, the you know the stop motion feature the challenge there is like to, again to sort of go down the the the, the 
the the root of creating a story that can sustain you know it's a short feature film it's like a 70 minute 80 75 minute film but still that's quite a lot a long amount of time to sustain stuff and to to to, to make a film that does not compromise on the kinds of things that I've done in my short uh, films because that because the feature does have dialogue in it um and uh because it's just necessary to tell the story but figuring out how to how to tell that story that has a lot of elements in it that are much more specifically real world elements but still retain the kind of strangeness you know of the of the short films right that's the challenge and so the stop motion one that's red laugh that's the red laugh yeah and that's based off a book yeah it's based on a book called leonid from from an or- a russian author called leonid andreev it's a uh, a very uh, visceral war story on one level but it's also about a sort of psychological very interior kind of very weird sort of um collective nightmare that happens to the inhabit- inhabitants of a small town after the people f- from the front line of the war start coming home and how did you find this book it was introduced to me by a friend, Ben Harvey, who's a writer. And uh, he just said, this is a great book and it's got images in it that are right up your street. <laughs> he gave it to me and I read it. It's quite a short novel and it's just full of like amazing images and very, very strange, very uh, disturbing ideas. And um, I, I, I always thought it would make a great film, but um, originally I was thinking of it as a live action film. And then when I met our mutual friend, Frank Murray, the producer... Who has been on this podcast. Who's been on this podcast. He's been on twice. He has been on twice. (laughs) The second time we did it in a pub. Right. Um, Yeah, and uh, we were talking about doing a project and he he specifically was interested in doing an animation project and asked if I had any projects. And I did have this one idea that was a sort of revenge movie about a gang of rodents who have fetishized the violence, sexually fetishized the violence done to them by cats. And they developed this weird, it was a bit like Crash, but with like, (laughs) mice and he didn't like that one <laughs> so he said have you got anything else so I said well there's this book The Red Laugh and, I, and it was only at that moment I thought well, actually I'd never thought of it as an animation film but maybe that could be really good actually as a, as a to remove it from reality and make it into a sort of a much more surreal you know treat, treatment of that book and so then we've you know we just we sort of took the um uh, you know the steps towards adapting it figuring out how to adapt it in a way that it wouldn't feel like a live action film that it would feel like an animation film do you feel very comfortable i suppose in your in your tone and and um your creative process now in taking things further in, into a 70 to 80 minute feature version of, of what you've been doing for the last however long now i think so i think the material is really good i think we've got a script now that feels more stripped down and less literary and less dramery than the first iterations of the script so it feels more like it fits into the into the the world that i've been doing um i think one of the challenges as i said is going to be the dialogue because i've never really done dialogue in animation before so i would be curious to see how far we could push either stylizing the dialogue or removing chunks of it just to, so that it is a more pure animation experience but it's it's a balance to get right where it's we're still able to tell the story without um making it sort of pure nonsense you know and i guess animating the mouse just adds a whole another layer of complexity or maybe not I don't yeah know. i think so but i think there are ways to do that for the editing or to minimizing the amount of because there's nothing more boring than lip sync <laughs> for me anyway so I'm not interested in it really um, but I think there could be ways to digitally do stuff or, or, or make it extremely minimal or well, there's voiceover in, in, in the film as well so a lot of it is kind of thoughts um, but I'm interested in figuring out ways to manipulate the dialogue in such a way that it feels just slightly off so it's not just it's not just doesn't just feel like a Disney movie where you or a Pixar movie where you just got a bunch of movie stars to come in and say the lines. You know, I want to I need to I need to figure out a an approach to the dialogue that is as 
that is as bespoke as the animation itself. Do you How do to treat it and approach it? Do you do that by looking at other films or other examples or like reading books or is there any particular approach that you take? No, it's more about figuring out a, a, a specific technical or aesthetic approach. I can't really think of another film that has has played with um, dialogue in a way that I would like to play with it to, to figure out a way to make it stranger than it is. Um, so I, I need to, I need to slightly go into the into into the into weird territory there. And does the prospect of I mean, what would you anticipate in terms of like a timeline for something like this for the shooting of, for the production of? Um, how many kind of man hours does it take to produce a minute's worth, let alone 80 minutes? Well, it depends on the nature of the production, how big the production is. We don't know those those things yet. We don't know what the budget, how much money we'll get yet. Um, I would certainly be wanting to work with a lot more people to do the animation because I'm not animating all of it <laughs> on my own no, no chance it's a lot of sit but, click yeah move, yeah sit click move but it's also about get, finding animators and getting them to sort of animate in the style I like I don't I really I'm very picky about stop motion the quality of stop motion that I like I don't like overacting like I see a lot of animation films where the characters just overact that like there's just too much movement too much performance I th I prefer characters that are quite minimal in the way that they behave. So, um, you know, and I like the imperfections of animation, stop motion animation. I don't want it to be too polished. So finding really skilled animators, but having them unlearn what they've learned to try and get them in more into a, a slightly more specific sort of um, way of animating, I think that's going to be a challenge. Mm. I've always been curious, I suppose, about as a director who kind of oversees and I suppose you've kind of answered this question but as a director who oversees a team of animators as opposed to specifically doing all of the animation um, is is it just about finding a team of people who can share your vision and share your voice or is it uh, is it kind of taking what everyone does and, and using that to your advantage what's the what's the process it's probably a balance of both of those things I think finding finding um a, a way of doing the animation where it where it feels correct for the story and and for what I like, but at the same time you don't want to close doors. You don't want to say you don't want to be a dictator. You want to be able to allow their own skill set to just to, to filter through because they'll bring stuff that you hadn't thought of. So it's finding the right people who are who are who are open to to, to exploring it in a way that is creative and 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 ending up on. You know, not just going to their bag of tricks and saying, "Oh, but but it, but it doesn't look cool," or "Yeah, but that movement's you know we can make it so technically so much smoother." That's not the point. It's about finding the 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 way of movement, the style of the animation that is that is correct for the feeling, and I guess that's my job is to is to is to find that balance with the with the team. Your work is. Um won a lot of accolades sort of all over the world and you've been commissioned like we've been speaking about by all these different places to uh, to create your work how is your the way that you define the success of your projects um, evolved from where you began to where you are now I think I mean I touched on this earlier where my like the most important thing for me and it sounds really selfish in a way but it's very important that when I finish something i can look at it and 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 feel like it is correct and um it feels good to me and feels like i'm happy with it and i'm pleased with it and it's maybe doing something a little bit different to what i've done before or pushing things a bit further or um but uh, but that it feels uncompromising and i don't mean uncompromising in in a in a in a way that it's like has to be you know transgressive or anything like that just i mean it feels like i have not compromised what i wanted to do with it and um then i think it's it's out of my control then it goes out into the world and uh, i don't have any say in it and um you can't control how other people will see it you want people to like it and you want people to to um be excited about it but there's nothing you can do about it. So I try 
not to get too worried about that. The last few things I've done, like the Basket Case film, had a much smaller audience because it's specifically for a a, a, a bonus feature on a Blu-ray. And that's really... So you're only going to see it if you go and buy... If you're a big Basket Face fan <laughs> and you go and buy the Blu-ray. Or a big Robert Morgan fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the re- reaction to that has been much smaller because it just hasn't had as big a thing. And I think I'm doing another thing at the moment for Arrow Films for another even more obscure movie, right. <laughs> which is going to have an even smaller audience. But it's been really fun to do it. Um, I'm sort of, you know, these these commissions have been really good for me to do. I'm sort of, in a way, I'm I'm wait I'm in waiting for the funding for the for the these two features in particular that are sort of at the front. One of them is partially funded. One of the live action films is partially funded now, and um, it's moving. It seems to be moving forward, but it's exciting. Yeah, hope, hopefully. I guess you're like, always slightly apprehensive until you're on set. Well, exactly. It's like I'm not. I'm trying not to think about it until it's until I'm actually on set. But it's we've got a chunk of we've got half the budget for that. So um, it's uh, it's it's it seems to be moving forward. But the commissions that I've been doing that if if the feature films weren't sort of gathering a bit of momentum, I think I would probably be more inclined to work on something that was going to have a bigger exposure that I could send to festivals and um, more like a, a film like Bobby Yeah, which was the last sort of, I suppose, big film I did. Um, these are more, I don't want to call them placeholders because I, I, I work hard on them and I want them to be good, but they're more just sort of, um, yeah, a better, better, it's also a better way of saying placeholder. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's building the brand and keeping yourself yeah. relevant. And, and they've, you know, I mean, I've been having a great. I mean, they've been the last two things because they've been they've been commissioned for films that I really like, the Basket Case, and the next one is um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say because they haven't announced it yet, but it's a, it's a, a a film I really liked when I was a teenager, and um, so it's been great for me to riff on these films that I, I loved when I was when I was a kid, essentially. Um, they're just not going to be seen by that many people, but mm. that's that's all right. Maybe at some point in the future they might be rediscovered and seen. But well, hopefully the Red Laugh will uh, will get funded, and then that will hit a very large audience. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. I really appreciate your time and insights and sharing your uh, experiences with me. I finish all of my conversations with the same question, and the same segue into the same question, and that is, what makes you silly? What makes me silly? Yeah. It's always a weird question to end these conversations with. Do you mean what makes me act silly or what makes... I mean, it's grammatically... I, I Actually, I say that it's grammatically ambiguous on purpose, but right. it's not. I just, when I first started this show, phrased that question and then about 10 episodes in went, oh, it doesn't actually make sense. Well, it's kind of open, isn't it? What makes me silly? Okay, well, I'll say my dog makes me silly. Right. In what way? Just brings out a really strange... Um, side of me that makes me want to lie down and sort of uh, uh, kind of put on really weird voices <laughs> and uh, and stroke the dog and um, um, behave slightly like a, 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 a dog myself <laughs> what sort of dog? she's a, um, a rescue dog from Greece but she's like a sort of amalgamation of pretty much every dog right <laughs> <laughs> into this kind of insane thing that, that is quite quite a beautiful animal yeah i used to have one of those in melbourne his name was bob bob yeah <laughs> my dog's name is pod right yeah it's kind of like bob yeah does pod ever eat your um models no actually she sort of sniffs them but that's about it <laughs> <laughs> will she be appearing in the red laugh well maybe she got a pretty amazing voice actually I, i've been quite interested in um Figuring out a way to use her uh, sort of screaming noise that she does when she sees cats. Right. So, uh, and it's very quite weird noise. So I might try and use it in something. Cool. Yeah. Well, I look forward to hearing it. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks so much, Rob. Thanks a lot. (laughs) 